When we're considering studying astrology in the seven word system method of looking at it, we start with the word no. And I think this is important to understand that very many people have a casual interest in astrology. And they might say that they're interested, but they wouldn't say that they're studying. So what is the difference between those two things? Are you casually interested? Is it something that you like reading about? Whereas you wouldn't call yourself a student. And I think that's the first thing to do is to identify yourself as a student of astrology. And that decision to identify yourself as that is an important first step. There are three obvious kind of levels, shall we say, of studying astrology. And one is this uh, level of casual interest. You want to know where the moon is. You want to see what the various kind of planets and signs means mean and so on. But then there's that kind of next level where you actually want to familiarize yourself with your own horoscope. You want to understand yourself through astrology. And that's your purpose. Now, to say that you're studying astrology by doing that, you're studying yourself, really, through astrology. But if you're studying astrology, it's because you're able to actually take someone else's horoscope and interpret that. That's the next level. So, where are you? Are you looking to do horoscopes for other people? And would that be a casual thing for friends and family? Or would you want to make money by doing it? So... Why don't you make a choice about identifying yourself as a student of astrology, as an astrologer, as somebody who intends to do astrology, horoscope readings for someone else, and perhaps even further than that, to end up as a, a teacher or a commentator on astrology. So that's the first stage, is to just identify yourself as a casual interest or a serious hobby or a staging point towards a profession, you know. And that makes a difference to how much of your time, particularly, and, and perhaps money, you allocate. And that's the next thing I would offer as a suggestion. This is not a, a, a simple, casual subject. This has kept me busy for 40 years. There's a lot to learn if you want to. And it takes time. You have to allocate time. So how much time have you got for astrology? An hour a week? Not enough. Hour a day? Yeah, okay. That's the difference, you see. If you can find a good deal of time for astrology, then you're a, a serious student of astrology. If you can't, well, you know, you're not. Um, most of the astrologers, I would say almost all of them that I've met, are obsessional. At some point in their lives, they're obsessional, and, and that doesn't really go away much. It, it, it grabs you, and if it's not grabbed you, then there's just so many other people around who it will grab. It's, it's a very competitive market now if you ever wanted to consider yourself in the market of, of providing horoscope readings. So that's the first thing. Choose to be an astrologer. Now, the second thing is, is hello, and this is all to do with study. Hello is expanding the mind. You're getting more and more information, opinions, and you expose yourself to astrology. So we're talking here about buying books, reading books. It's a big difference between those two things. Um, most people don't seem to read everything they buy, do they? And uh, there's a lot of information online. Now, some of it is, is good, some of it isn't. There's a lot more rubbish than there is good stuff. So think carefully about what influences you're taking on. And typically, if you go to a bookshop and you can see the various writers, you don't have to spend very much time reading a particular book to know whether it speaks to you or not. And some of the older writers that are going back 100 years or 50 years... Um, these people really did research their work before they wrote and check out which of the, the writers really is, is your cup of tea not necessarily the best astrologers became the best writers their style of presentation just didn't ever 
convey the wisdom that they had very succinctly or easily. So you, you have to choose how you can pick up this information. But most assuredly, you have to expose yourself to lots and lots of other opinions. And nowadays, of course, you can do that online. You can join forums. You can check out websites. You can study all that there is. And some of the websites that you come across are really excellent. Cafe Astrology, Afro Dienst. There's some really excellent material out there written by very good astrologers. So try and find a source and and limit your exposure to some extent once you've studied what there is you know just f refine it down and, and now we're coming to the next kind of level with this and that would be thank you what do you appreciate what do you value what touches your feelings in astrology it's um a subject which has been much studied in the past by highly intellectual people. The, the major impulse that gave rise to 20th century astrology came in around the 1890s or so by uh, a group of people called the Theosophists. And they were highly intellectual people that were trying to demonstrate the, the spiritual philosophy within astrology and to prove that it worked. Fine. What happened in the 20th century was that Carl Jung got involved and turned the whole subject into a much more psychological study. We became much more interested in the person rather than the philosophy. And then astrology became softer and much more personally biased towards caring and trying to help rather than trying to get the client to understand. We were trying to help them get through an emotional process. So astrology changed, and your preferences change as to what you like, which teachers, which writers appeal to your sense of the, the beauty, the aesthetics of astrology. So that's all to do with thank you, you know, just registering your own preferences within astrology. It's just such a wide subject. Uh, it's huge. There is no limit, no end to what you can do with it. So you're going to have to exercise some value judgments here. Not only what you want to do with it, your purpose, but also how, how you get it, how it is for you, and um, the extent to which you want rational explanations, and the extent to which you're going to trust your intuition and so on. You have to make judgments about that. And um, that's thank you. So the goodbye aspect of this work is the, the various stages that you go through. Goodbye represents that we've reached that point and we don't have to study it again. And, and then we've reached another point and another point. Very often there's an examination, a test, a question given to us. And so with astrology, moving from a casual interest to being a, a serious student, how do you know? Well, what's, the, what's the measure of, of that? And of course it has to do with whether or not you understand some of the basics. So let's start with the basics. What do the planets mean? What do the signs mean? Which signs are cardinal, fixed, and mutable? Which is earth, air, fire, water? What do houses mean? What are aspects? How big an orb do you use for a semi-square? Is that the same for a trine? You know, all of this kind of stuff, the basics. That's your first level. You need to know that and to test yourself on that. To give yourself little self-examinations. Now another measure of, of how serious you are is whether or not you know your own horoscope. And then that means the specific degrees and the minutes of all the planets and the aspects and which aspects you've got, whether you're counting them as aspects because of the orbs. And to some serious extent how you interpret that, bearing in mind that all of the interpretations that you've read, studied, and heard, they all differ from one another to some extent. Everyone says what they think, and nobody agrees. Nobody at all agrees with anyone else. Not precisely. Generally, yes, but not precisely. So what's your precise interpretation 
of your own horoscope. And of course, that's a movable feast, but the ability to name where your planets are by degree and minute and the aspects, that's, that's an examination that uh, really is a, a mark of, of how seriously you're taking it. And then we move on to transits. That's another level of, of involvement with astrology. When you understand what a transit is, what it does, what's going on right now, and which transits you're going through. And I, th I think personally that transits tell you, give you the most direct information about what's going on for a person. If I see somebody's horoscope, I will first of all see what the horoscope tells me, but within the first minute, I'll look at what transit's going on for them, by which I mean the outer planet transits, Pluto, Uranus, and Neptune particularly. And that always tells me why they've come right now. In other words, it is the reality of the moment. So you need to know what your transits are, because actually your transits are informing your perception of life. You're not going to appreciate astrology in the same way if you're going through a strong Neptune moon transit compared to a strong Pluto sun transit. Astrology will be different for you. So you have to have that level of understanding. And I think at some point you have to study synastry as well, how well you get along with other people and see the astrological indicators of that. So those are the kind of examination points to let you know how seriously you're taking astrology. And that's to do with the word goodbye. Now the word please in the seven word system is about a vision, about sharing your vision cooperatively with another person. So in astrology, in the study of astrology, that really has a lot to do with where you're going long term with this. And most of us don't know, we don't care, we're just interested in astrology and we don't have any long-term intentions. That's mainly the case. But at some point, it, that, it, that can change. Do you want to take it serious, seriously enough to study on a course, to get examined, to get certificates? Do you want to practice astrology? Now, if you do, then there's a few things that you, you really have to take care of. Like you have to get a blog going, some kind of website. You have to get social media presence. You have to find your clients. Because you can't practice astrology without clients. And so when you've moved to this higher level of, of involvement in astrology, it becomes more than astrology. It becomes interface with the world at large, which brings you into the realm of knowing how to use computers and, and that kind of thing a lot more diligently than ever before. Um, that's a big stage. Yeah. Um, now there's another quite different stage of astrology and not everybody gets to this level or, or choice with it. And that is um, to use it for awakening within yourself and your client a, a, a sense of sacredness. We mustn't really forget that astrology a long time ago was what they had by way of understanding the nature of reality, understanding how the gods, as they saw them, were working and um, the impact upon self of these divine impulses. It was a sacred study. And it's no less so today. It's not studied in that way quite so much. In fact, very rarely. But it offers... Um, a spiritual path of guidance. Now, if you were to take astrology as your path towards spiritual evolution, you will start to reinterpret the planets. You will see them then as indicators of higher wisdom rather than problems to overcome. You, a Pluto transit would then become a joy, a great advantage, an opportunity for you instead of a pain in in your life. Um, so to move towards sacredness is, is it, this, this takes us into another region. And when we start to sort of think about the word sorry in the seven word system, sorry is our feedback device. When we do something that's wrong, 
we cause insensitive behavior to occur and, and we impact negatively on someone else so we have to say sorry now in astrology the equivalent here is the feedback system we operate bearing in mind we're taking on all of this information all of these opinions all of these different perspectives from a vast array of commentators I don't know how many of them have checked out their data I, I suspect very few I would think that most opinions about astrology are regurgitated from somebody else's writings. And that person didn't check it out either. I don't think very many people ever bother to check out whether their predictions come to pass or whether their interpretations are actually valid. So if you're serious about astrology at the very high level and it's a sacred thing for you, then you'd need to do that. You'd need to check that when you say something, it actually fits. So you'd learn to speak differently as you presented your ideas. You would talk about a transit, talk about an aspect, talk about a configuration, and see whether or not there was information coming back from you, from the client, in accordance with that. Sometimes you actually get it wrong. And sometimes what is wrong works. So you could actually say something by mistake and it actually really resonates with the client. On, on one or two occasions in my life, I've actually done that. I, I've, I've misread the chart and I've said something. And they said, yes, I'm so pleased you said that. <laughs> so something's going on there which makes that kind of interpretation valid even though it's in error. And we have to sort of make, make a, um, ourselves aware of when we're getting feedback and um, one of the first levels of feedback is if you create a horoscope, uh, just check it. You know, before you start talking about the horoscope, ask the client, you were born at such and such a time in such and such a place, weren't you? And they might be uh, knowledgeable and you say, and your ascendant is so and so, is it? You know, you just check it with them <laughs> because... Um, we make mistakes, we're human, or everyone makes a mistake at some point. And it's good to check the horoscope is, is, is the right one before you start talking about it. Now the final word in the seven word system is yes, and this is to do with surrender and um, just allowing things to be. So in this case, we kind of, um, we pick up a, a lot of astrology through osmosis. In other words, we put ourselves around astrology and astrologers and other students and we just swim in the sea of astrology. By absorption, it comes to us. That's, that's probably how most astrology is learned, actually. Um, and that, that means we have to be open and to give in to impulses and understandings that don't really check out on the, the rational level. And that's the same, and I think this is the highest form of astrology, and I actually think this is how astrology works, that we move ourselves into a state of grace where we allow what is called channeled flow of information. But I, I think when you start talking to a client, you have to allow there to be an inspirational aspect coming from a higher source that you don't think about. And that openness takes you out of the realm of thinking and remembering and having been a good student and knowing what you're talking about into another realm where you just allow yourself to be a channel for the, the information that's coming through. And also understanding that that, that works both ways, that the, the client or the student or who, whomever they're not going to understand it the same way that you do. They're not going to hear what you said in the chart reading. You know, they're going to hear what they wanted to hear, what they needed to hear. They're going to block out information that they can't take and accept whatever they need to hear, whether you said it or not. And you have to accept that. Astrology is not a definitive science. It's an art. And therefore, it's going to be interpreted differently by everyone. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or well, so is astrology.